Welcome back. In this section, we're going to discuss the importance of managing your communication resources. So let's first talk about phone management. Now, communicating over the phone is an integral part or component of conducting business for any business entrepreneur. Outstanding phone techniques and communication etiquette are critical in making your phone conversations more effective, thereby promoting you and your business as a truly professional operation. You need to create a great first impression. Try to answer the phone on the second ring. Answering the phone too quickly can catch the caller off guard. But waiting too long is inconsiderate to the caller's time. Answer with a friendly greeting. For example, Good afternoon, customer service. This is Mick. How can I help you? Always smile. It shows right through the phone. Ask the caller for their name, even if their name is not necessary for the call. This shows the caller that you have truly taken an interest in them. You may want to write down their name as soon as they say it so you don't forget it. You can always use it again later in the conversation. Speak clearly and slowly. Never talk with anything in your mouth, including gum. Lower your voice if you normally speak loudly. Keep the phone about two finger widths away from your mouth. When you put callers on hold, ask permission first. Examples of how to do this might include, Would you mind holding while I get your file? Or, Can you please hold briefly while I see if Mr. Jones is available? When taking a caller off of hold, thank them for holding for you. Now, what about transferring a caller? Well, if the caller needs to speak to another person or department, transfer the caller directly to the desired person's extension or voicemail, not to an operator. This will prevent the caller from having to explain his or her request again, and it will reduce the number of times the caller is transferred. Also, when transferring a caller, tell them who they will be transferred to and announce the caller to the person that you are transferring them to. When taking a phone message for someone, be sure to include the caller's name and company name if applicable, the date and time of the call, what is the call regarding, if the caller wants a return phone call, and the phone number at which the caller can be reached. You need to protect your time. It's your most valuable asset. When you leave a voicemail for someone, if the issue you are calling about is a straightforward question, ask it on the voicemail to avoid playing phone tag. Also encourage the responder to leave the answer on your voicemail if they miss you. If you know you will be in meetings or unavailable at certain times, let the person know in order to avoid playing phone tag. If you are in the middle of a complex task that requires an uninterrupted thought process, let voicemail answer the phone. Phone messages should be responded to within 24 hours. If you have been too tied up to answer a question or an inquiry, at least respond to the person who called to let them know and to give them an expected date or time that you might have the answer for them. This way, you will appear responsive and professional, even if you cannot address their request immediately. Make lasting impressions with callers. Before hanging up, make sure that you have answered all of the caller's questions. Always end with a pleasantry, like, have a nice day, or, it was nice speaking with you. And then let the caller hang up first. This shows the caller that you are not in a hurry to get off the phone with them. But what about email management? Well, writing and managing quality email is very important. It's about sharing what you know. Business owners have an advantage in this area. They are typically very passionate about what they do, and they know their business. Building a list of customers who are interested in your products and services and who want to learn more can be quite easy with just a few smart moves. A benefit of email marketing over direct mail is that emails can be a very powerful tracking tool for your business. Unlike postal mailings that disappear when they are sent out, Emails offer business owners the opportunity to get valuable customer feedback very quickly. 
including things like how many recipients opened the email, who specifically opened the message, what time of day did they open it, and if they clicked through to other links on your website. Now, this look into the customer's mind is invaluable to the business owner. You can track what is working well and what is making people curious. But just remember, with the power of email comes the responsibility to be relevant to your customers and to your potential customers and not just to overwhelm them and their inboxes. But when it does occur, how do you cope with email overload? Well, the problem of email overload has become so intrusive today that the Washington Post recently wrote about the growing trend of declaring email bankruptcy in order to assert freedom from responding to old emails. But for the majority of us who just can't opt out of the entire email world, there is a need to develop some reasonable expectations about the effective and controlled use of email and to create some semblance of order in the unregulated universe where email resides. It's time to become aggressive about decreasing the trillions. Yes, I said trillions with a T. The trillions of emails that are sent out annually. With no regulating body and nothing but our own self-restraint to guide us, perhaps it's time to develop a consensus about how we should control, rather than be controlled, by email. Email is one of those necessary evils, like credit cards, mobile phones, and texting. We can't live with them, and today's society won't let us live without them. But don't despair. Just learn how to do it better, smarter, and faster in order to restore your sanity, improve your reputation as a professional communicator, and to put you back in control of your email. Now here's some of the ways that you can maintain control. First, stop the proliferation of illiteracy. Now we all know how busy everyone is, but there's a reason why grammar and punctuation were invented. They make words easier to read and create order out of written communication chaos. Stop wasting other people's time trying to determine where one sentence ends and another one begins. What has worked for decades with business correspondence should also translate into today's electronic communications. Don't forward non-essential emails. If you absolutely must forward some emails, at least have the courtesy of deleting the endless stream of reply to's and forwards and previously forwards that precedes the text. It's nothing but a waste of the recipient's time to endlessly scroll down the page in search of an actual message. And the message is usually lost on smartphones and Blackberries and iPhones and other PDAs, where users typically give up rather than wait for the screen to continually be prompted to search further. Now here's what to do to keep some order. If the subject changes at all, send a new email using a new subject title. Remember, the subject title should say it all and give the recipient a clear and concise idea of what your message is all about. If the subject is still the same, but only some sections of the chain remain relevant, cut and paste the relevant sections of the original message into a new one. And for long messages, Type your reply in a different color in the body of the original message. This will help to identify what section of the message you are replying to. For shorter messages and short replies, set your software to type your entire reply in a different color. Don't select Reply All. But again, check to be sure who is absolutely necessary to reply to. Very rarely do others need to see your reply to a sender's inquiry especially when so many group emails are simply announcements or scheduling inquiries or other notices of some sort. Other people just don't care that you have said thank you in response to the sender. Control your urge to respond immediately. Only check your email two or three times a day. Opening every single email as it arrives distracts you away from any task that you are currently working on. And having broken your chain of thought, it may take you hours to get back on track again. 
In today's world of global communication, we often bow to the pressures of immediacy. But before you get caught up in this new communication myth, ask yourself, what will really happen if I don't see every email as it hits my computer? Truly, twice a day is usually more than enough. Go on, live dangerously, and turn off the Notify Me option on your email software. Not all emails deserve a response. Emails, even though they're often compared to a telephone conversation in slow motion, are really nothing of the sort. They are the same as all correspondence, just with new rules of etiquette and new levels of access and speed. Although, unlike telephone conversations, not all emails need or even expect a response. You neither have to acknowledge receipt of all messages, nor do you need to have the last word in a chain of reply messages. The original sender probably didn't expect a reply, and you have just added to his or her already substantial list of emails for that day. Unless you are specifically asked for a reply to a specific action, or you must advise the recipient of some vital piece of additional information, don't reply. Unless told otherwise, be discriminating with your reply button, and everyone will be better off. Think and cool off before hitting the reply button. Now, emails are often like conversations, but with time between each speaker. Use this time effectively. For example, if the message that you received sets your blood boiling, the temptation might be to hit the reply button immediately with an equally inflammatory retort. Don't do that. Take time to consider what you are saying. Unlike the spoken word, the written word will last forever and you can't take it back. Don't use groups to send all of your emails. Now We all complain about the sheer number of emails that hit our computers every single day. Most of them are a complete waste of time, but we usually have to open them just to find this out. When you use standard groups to send emails, either because of laziness or to cover yourself so people can't say that you weren't told something, you just add to this oversupply of useless emails. Emails are a communication system and should be used to do just that, communicate. You wouldn't invite the entire church to the minister's study if you just wanted to speak with him, would you? Use the same logic when it comes to email. Your colleagues will thank you for it. And if you pass this tip on to them, your own inbox might just lose some weight too. So if you think it's absolutely necessary to send emails to a group, then mark the email clearly with either for your action or for your information only in the subject line so that the recipients can easily determine its priority and choose when to open it or choose if they even want to open it. Use signature blocks to save time. Most email software allows you to design a number of signature blocks which are texts that allow you to sign off using any words that you like. You could create one for external customers, using a more formal farewell, your job title, your phone, fax details, and a company slogan or message of the month. But for more personal emails, you might create a signature block with an informal farewell, maybe just your first name and some fun sign-off. Yes, it's okay to have fun at work, even when dealing with your dreaded email system. Filter messages to get rid of unwanted bulk mail. Again, use the features of your email software to help remove bulk mail or junk email before it even reaches your inbox. Most software will allow you to filter out junk mail based on the options such as blocking the BCC, which is blind copies, or blocking mail from certain addresses or you can even color code junk mail so that you can recognize it or moving junk mail into a separate folder so that you can deal with it later. Know what your software can do and use it to save yourself time, effort, and energy. Fact, people typically only use about 20% of their software's capabilities. How much are you using? Group your incoming email for more efficient reading. 
you spend a significant amount of time opening and reading your email every single day. This is time that could be better spent on more profitable or more productive activities. One way to use this time more efficiently would be to file your emails before you even open them so that you can decide which ones need urgent opening and which ones could wait, maybe until you have an extra 15 minutes to spare. Most email software allows you to set up rules for incoming emails. The system will direct emails into folders that you have set up depending on the rules that you apply. An example could be setting up folders based on words contained in the subject line, or the address of the sender, or keywords in the message itself. Once the incoming emails have been sorted for you, you can choose when to open them based on the importance of each folder. Again, check your email software for this and other time-saving options. Use folders to organize your correspondence. Why do you keep any of your emails? So that you can have access to them if and when you need it, right? But how often have you tried to find a particular email and 45 minutes later you are still wading through files, ready to throw your computer through the nearest window? For organization purposes, just as letters can be filed in various filing cabinets, emails should be filed in folders on your computer's hard drive. Create folders that make sense to you. For example, you might use customers, suppliers, personal, and so on. But remember, file skinny, not fat. What I mean is, put fewer emails in each folder and use more folders. This will make it much easier to retrieve the exact email that you're looking for, especially if you get a lot of mail on this one particular topic. And remember to create a read later file for emails that might not need your immediate attention. And use your archive function to keep your folders a manageable size. Apply archive dates by folder so that you can choose to keep frequently accessed information for longer periods of time and archive less important information more often. This also helps the retrieval process enormously. Make sure you stay legal. Now this is a major topic. A whole new industry has been recently spawned to keep watch over the legality of email transmissions. Simply put, take extra care when sending emails which have not been written or authored by you, including the common practice of forwarding messages sent to you. Just like books and articles, copyright on email belongs to the writer, not the recipient. If you have any doubts about forwarding another person's message, then just don't do it. Think before using email. Email often is seen as informal communication, quick, efficient, and immediate. But for many, especially those people whose careers began before the email revolution, email is not the medium for well-mannered communication. So before you send an email, ask yourself what the recipient is expecting. In some cases, snail mail might be a better option especially if speed is not the primary issue. Other examples where traditional mail may be a better choice include customer presentations or proposals, formal requests or invitations, references, bulky correspondence like reports, or when you're trying to make a good impression. Email can usually be considered either a blessing or a curse. You need to either take control over your email jungle or keep cursing each time another email hits your inbox. The choice is yours. The bottom line is that email should be a tool that serves us, rather than the form of slavery that it has become. As we all experience the barrage of emails overtaking us, we need to gain control and create a more ordered cyber universe that evolves around a common ground of email etiquette. And what about those anti-spam laws? Ah, yes. Spam. You know all about it. You've been hit by it. And you hate it. Maybe you've even gotten used to it to a certain degree. But chances are you simply delete any emails that you know are spam. But those few seconds here and there are sure annoying. And you certainly don't need to waste any more precious time during your workday, do you? Well, over the years, spam has frustrated, confused, and 
and annoyed email users the world over. The total volume of spam has leveled off slightly in most recent years, mainly because of better email filtering. About 80% of all spam worldwide is sent by fewer than 200 spammers. That's right. They are usually sent by what's called botnets, or bots, which are nothing more than a network of virus-infected computers. Congress passed the Can Spam Act of 2003 to crack down on the junk emails that plague inboxes. This legislation prohibits sending marketing emails that contain false or misleading information or just using deceptive subject headings. It authorizes an $11,000 penalty per violation for spamming each individual recipient. What that means is that a spammed email sent to just 100 people could cost the sender fines in excess of $1 million. The law also bans addressed harvesting, which is when bulk email services use software programs that scan personal and business web pages to lift email addresses, which they then sell for email marketing purposes. In addition, the Act requires that adult content be labeled as such. And all emails must offer an opt-out provision which allows recipients to cut off new emails and prohibits companies from sending additional emails when that is done. Every time you send an email, it's your reputation going out the door. When you first email a potential customer, remind them who you are and how they know you. Do that right at the top of the message and be sure to place the opt-out information at the top of the first email too. The point of doing this is to show the recipient that you respect their privacy. I would also caution you against building an email list from trade shows and other venues like that where the main draw was for the free items that your business was giving away. Instead, focus on approaching potential customers who are genuinely interested in your product or service. You should always be clear and conspicuous about who you are. And even though how often you send out emails may be company specific, a good rule of thumb is that once or twice a week should be the upper limit. Make sure your potential customers see value in what you send in your emails. Make sure you demonstrate what's in it for them. If you handle how you capture your emails correctly, by focusing on a quality list of people who are interested in your product, you'll have fewer opt-outs and plenty of added sales. So what can you do to protect yourself against spam? Well, spam has grown since the early 1990s, and today accounts for over 100 billion messages daily across the globe. That's approximately 45% of all emails. The AOL alone gets over 250,000 spam-related complaints from customers every single day. Some global research groups estimate that spam costs business owners nearly $200 billion every year in lost employee time, IT support, email maintenance, and spam blocking equipment. So what options do you have to protect yourself, your computers, and your company? Well, first, filters and validators are a couple of great ideas for blocking spam and for avoiding email-related viruses, malware, and spyware. There are also computer software programs available that aid in the protection against these malicious cybernet tactics. Email filters are designed to automatically identify common spam techniques and to keep them out of your normal inbox. Filters of some type are generally part of every email platform. They are used by most internet service providers and email services to block extremely common email spam tactics. Filters catch a lot of spam, but spammers are always cracking filters and fighting to keep ahead of the technology. It's a never-ending battle. On the other hand, validators attempt to solve the problem by using whitelists and blacklists to categorize desirable and undesirable emails. This method involves a certain amount of manual labor, usually on the part of the person sending you the email. They have to fill out the validation form to confirm that the email is coming from a living, breathing person rather than a spam program. So even though there appears to be no end in sight for the war against spam, there are still ways to stay on the winning side. A little setup time with validation tools 
anti-spam and virus protection tools can save you a great deal of time and headache later down the road.